morning everyone and welcome to the 10 Express. We'll be your host for today. I'm Tiff and I'm joined by Jared Friday. Hey Tiff, how are you doing? Not too bad. I think it's going to be a really exciting first show this morning. So let us know a little bit about what's coming up today. Okay, so some of today's highlights include a significant death that happened 40 years ago, a special... You know, a special story on men's mental health and the breaking down of stigma, and we're joined with our producer, Brett, for that. Um, and one of the world's most controversial debating topics, of course. Ooh, I yes. wonder what that's going to be. Well, we'll let you guys know later off in the show, but first we'll jump right into our news headlines. So you'll be glad to know that North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, has decided against an order to attack the island of Guam. This was reported on Tuesday by the Korean Central News Agency, who had previously released a statement detailing the attack. Kim will instead be watching the US actions for a little longer. A stunt woman on the set of Deadpool 2 has died while attempting to ride down a flight of stairs. Joy S.J. Harris, aged 40, had performed the stunt four times before losing control of her motorcycle. S.J. was not wearing a helmet at the time of the accident due to the nature of the character she was portraying. Uh, and she veered into a shop front window, which proved to be fatal. Ryan Reynolds, the Deadpool star, has tweeted his condolences to the family. And Harbour Town's owners, Ash Morgan, have announced that the precinct will soon be known as the District Docklands. The area is undergoing a $150 million revamp to encourage crowds at night and on the weekends. We'll be seeing a brand new H&M store, a new Hoyt cinema complex, and new retailers such as the New Zealand brand Canterbury, uh, Cotton On and General Pants Co. And we have some news headlines for you as well. Yeah, um, an umpire was forced to run run for his life after a spectators at an under 18s football grand final uh, threw punches and you know, chased him off the ground in Melbourne's West on Sunday. Ridiculous, yeah. Um, the brawl broke out after the umpire uh, gave two concussive 50 metre penalties. No, oh, sorry, consecutive 50 metre penalties. Sorry, I don't know much about football here. Uh, to Point Cook. In the last 30 seconds of the grand final against Albion, the Point Cook players were forced to celebrate the win in the change rooms after the game because of the disruption. Um, soon, AFL club champions... Uh, some, sorry, some, some. Very, very sorry. As once again, don't know much about footy. <laughs> um, some AFL club champions have announced their retirements with Western Bulldogs. Captain Bob Murphy retiring at the end of the season with three-time premiership. Hawthorne star Josh Gibson has already played his last game for the club. Murphy missed out on playing in his side's record-breaking premiership win last season due to an injury, while Gibson struggled with his own injury problems this season after playing a key role in Hawthorne's hat-trick of three wins. Hmm. Um, Gibson joins fellow premiership teammate Luke Hodge in hanging up the boots at the end of the season. And now today's weather. In the beautiful city of Melbourne... Uh, there will be a top of 16, followed by a low of 9 this evening. That's not bad. That's too yeah, shit right. weather yeah, yeah. for so me. It's, like, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I can't complain. So now like we've got to, got to call our segment on this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So today on this day, 40 years ago, our singer-songwriter Elvis Presley died at age 42. Yeah, I know, right? Like how? It's ages ago. Um, so Elvis lives on through the music uh, that he created, and the impressionists that are now like super famous, you know, like, you know, you you've heard of it, Elvis Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. There's everywhere, absolutely everywhere, um, which has become like a massive industry in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the songs that you know, your parents, your grandparents, and like you know, their friends, and like me, you know, we're all <laughs> we're all about Elvis. Yeah, and then there's some of not us... Not that you're too old either. No, no, no. You're never but too young to be an Elvis e fan. Exactly, exactly. But then there's some of us that are just like, who is this guy? Like, what's going the on? The millennials. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's you know, like who is them. this guy from the 50s? Why does he matter to me? <laughs> um, yeah, and Elvis was really instrumental in, like, the evolution of music in the 1950s and, like, had, you know, like, made it real, like, uh, music a real popular thing in, like, Western culture. Yeah, he is. Yeah, He's a really, really cool. pivotal figure, especially yeah, when exactly. we come back to 50s culture and we're thinking about the old-fashioned car shows, we're thinking about the American oh, diners. 110%. Yeah. 
I bet that Elvis would be playing on the jukebox right now in any one of the American diners in Melbourne. Yeah, there's actually a diner down in South Yarra on Soda Rock, and they have a big, like, monumental uh, Elvis statue at the front oh, door. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really, really cool. Um, well, I think Elvis is so special because uh, his single, The Heartbreak Hotel, sold 10 million records within the first 10 months. Yeah, yeah, no, it was like, it was a big song. Big song. Oh, yeah. Big song. Big I can't big recall big. that one personally, but I do have a few other favourites. Really? Like oh, Hound okay. Dog, that's a good oh, one. Hound, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hound Dog's a good one. And his blue suede shoes. Oh, a oh, classic. Classic, yeah? <laughs> of course. As well as um, his debut song, Love Me Tender, uh, which was reported on September the 27th. For the first time in the history of the record business, a single record has achieved a million sales before being released to the yeah. public. Um, yeah, no, it, it had its public release like way later. Um, and the song just got like wind from like commercial advertisement. Which is crazy. Yeah, I know, right? It's f- ridiculous. Um, did you know that he was a bus driver? No. Yeah, he was, wow. a, he was a bus driver before he became, like, this internationally acclaimed artist. And it was, like, it was ridiculous because, like, you know, like a boy from Memphis, you know, you don't think that, like, he was probably doing his bus driving and he was just like, ah, oh, I probably can't, can't, can't do this singing stuff because it wasn't that big back then. Yeah, you know? exactly. But like, 1950s, so what's changed? Plus, you think of, like, the bus driving career today yeah. didn't have any artists. Yeah, exactly. They're just kind of Ridiculous. stuck in their day He was probably job. singing along in, like, the bus driver, you know, in the bus, just singing yeah. along. And it's just like, maybe I'll give this a crack. Yeah, I was thinking, well, you think of, like, to the Simpsons, so they have their bus driver called Otto, and he has his, always, he has his Walkman on always, and oh, he's yeah. always jamming along. Of course, of course. <laughs> um... Yeah, like bus driver. Oh, yeah, and that's another thing, like him being, you know, like a boy from Memphis. Like when he grew up and like became really famous, he had a house in Hollywood and he had a house in Memphis. So oh, that's like good. he'd only spend like four months of the year in the Hollywood house because he really enjoyed being in Memphis and you know helping out the local businesses that he grew yeah. up. Yeah, which is like I think I, it I, is. Not many cool. celebrities these days are so grounded and so down to earth. Yeah, but I think that was like just the thing, like back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it was like it was a hundred percent like the thing. Like you, you, you've moved out of home. You did what you needed to do, and then when you have felt like you wanted to start raising a family or something like that, you moved back. Yeah. I mean, me moving back to Colac. Probably not a, probably not a substantial <laughs> thing that I'm gonna <laughs> end up doing. But like back in those days, that's what it was like. That's what it was. That's good. It was yeah. ridiculous. Um, do you have any other cool things about Elvis? Like, well, I used to watch this TV show on the ABC, yeah. which was I think it was called Baby Elvis. Oh, Quite okay. Me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But they had yeah, it was a lot of his history. Or his dad was the proper Elvis, and then this baby was left, and he grew up in Tennessee in the South. Oh, it was really, really cool. it was cool. It that's was cool, and some of the music they did was in, like inspired as well. Yeah. So yeah, it was a good come home from school and watch it. Cool. Type of show. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. So like now, well, after we've discussed Elvis, like we've got another thing coming up. Yeah. Where are they now? Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. actually, um, this is jumping into a little bit of our discussion topic, our great debate. Where are they now? What about the creator of the pineapple pizza? Hawaiian pizza. Mr. Um, Sam Panopoulos? Panopoulos, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So, like, the topic that divides families, of course. Um, Absolutely. The creator of the pineapple pizza, Mr. Sam Panopoulos, uh, he was a Greek Canadian, uh, claimed he created the first Hawaiian pizza in satellite restaurant Chatham, Ontario, in Canada. Yeah, that's weird. Hawaiian pizza. When you think, when I think of pizza, I think of Italy. When I think of pizza, I definitely don't think of Canada. I know. You know, it's so cold. Why? Like, what? What? That's not a pizza. The Canadian invention. Well, actually, Sam died earlier this year at the age of eighty-three. Oh no way! Which is sad because pineapple pizza. Earlier this year. Yeah. Oh, that's really. It's recent. That's recent. It tugs on my heartstrings a little bit. Yeah, I know, right? Because pineapple pizza has been such a pivotal kind of food in my growing up. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it was one I of the it was one of the I'm... safe foods that I could always order at a restaurant, and it'd be it'd be perfect every can't, time. Can't say I'm the biggest fan, but Ooh. but but you know everyone has their differences and that sort of thing. Well, um, he moved from Greek Greece to Canada with his two brothers. Oh, did you know that? That's it's ridiculous. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I wonder exactly. what inspired him to do that. Was it just to open his um, pizza restaurant, maybe? No, I think it was more like, you know, it was like of a young age sort of thing. And then, like, he just fell into, like, pizza. Yeah, with, like, he just Canada wanted to and change. Stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's what it was. Um, so, Tiff, you have something about the time. About the time. About the time and about the show. What are, what are we doing? Ah, uh, well, thank you for tuning in to The Ten Express. <laughs> We're broadcasting every Wednesday at 10 a.m. from the brand new Media Hub. And you can follow us live on upstart.net.au as well as our Facebook and Twitter page at The Ten Express. That's The One Zero Express. Yeah. yeah. We, we, run, we run a pretty cool gig. So <laughs> get down in here and have a watch. We'll now jump into our feature story with men's health being a prevalent issue in society over year, over the years. There has been a reluctance by men to speak up on this issue. However, work is being done to help those suffering in a non-judgmental way. Eden Heininen has more on this story. Suicide is the leading cause of death for Australians between the ages of 15 and 44, with around 3,000 people committing suicide each year. That's on average eight a day, and of those eight, six are men. The topic of depression in Australian society, particularly for men, is often shut down by the tough Aussie attitude to man up and get on with it. But this dark, silent issue amongst men is slowly gaining life through open conversation. Recently, a panel discussion with La Trobe University, Beyond Blue, and the AFL Players Association was hosted by Nick Del Santo on the Better Out Than In campaign. I was offered or invited to come along and, and host the panel discussion, but it's also as nice as that is, and that's sort of the personal development part, like I enjoy the public speaking. I'm also interested in this topic, um, becoming more acutely aware now that I've finished football about friends that are potentially going through these mental health issues, um, but also just an awareness of yourself. And I've had those thoughts myself after finishing footy about, you know, who am I, what do I belong to, how do people view me, all those sort of things. So trying to get an understanding, and I feel like I'm healthy, absolutely I feel like I'm healthy, but just trying to understand a little bit more about it. Former Carlton and current Geelong VFL player Jake Edwards spoke about his experiences with depression. I had everything going right for me in my life. You know, everyone on the outside looking in were ticking boxes, you know, I've just signed a, a new contract, I had, a, I had a partner at the time, I just built a, I bought a house. I'm living my dream as a, as a footballer. This one thing I want to do my whole entire career. So the frustration not being able to bounce out of bed and get the training and be motivated uh, to, to be in this environment was e extremely con conflicting. However, it's not just Jake who has spoken publicly about problems with mental health. Players like Travis Cloak, Tom Boyd, Buddy Franklin and Tom Downing, who carry fame, talent and wealth, have all either taken time off from playing to receive treatment or quit the game completely. I looked at Buddy Franklin, I still do now, as one of the best players in the league, has been for 10 odd years. He lives in Bondi, he earns really good money, his wife's a supermodel, and you look at him and think, wow, this guy has got everything that you are. I love my wife, by the way. I'm not telling you, I don't want his wife. <laughs> but he lives this lifestyle, he's had success, premierships, everything that I've ever wanted, and then all of a sudden he puts his hand up and saying, I've got mental health issues, so if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody. To help better understand the true nature of depression and other mental illnesses, La Trobe sports psychologist Dr Paul O'Halloran shares his research on its early signs. But for me it's about those, those real changes in terms of how you're, you're functioning physiologically. So if all of a sudden you, you're finding it really hard to get out of bed, if you're feeling really fatigued, if you're finding it really difficult to concentrate constantly, if you're finding that you need a lot more sleep or less sleep and you can't, you're finding it difficult to sleep, if you've got major changes to your appetite, but I would say one of the major things would be that, that perceived loss of pleasure in life. People who are truly depressed feel like they're not going to derive any pleasure from anything. Yeah, I think it also shows that if you can tick certain things off in your life, and now that I'm out of the game, a lot of people speak about money. These players earn so much money. It doesn't make you happy. Where it really matters, if that, you know, inside that intrinsic sort of feeling and happiness that you get, money doesn't tick those boxes. Yeah, you have a nice house. Yeah, you've got a lovely car but that's not the happiness, you know, and I think that's a reflection on the mental health issues that the players are coming out with, and we've had three or four in the last couple of months, and I think it just highlights once again and, shows, and sheds light on if you work in construction, if you're a school teacher, if you're an AFL player, it doesn't matter. We're all going through the same issues. So how do we help a mate 
or someone we know who won't speak up. The best advice I can give to you is to, to be consistent uh, and don't get frustrated and don't make it about you because the minute you make it about you, you're going to validate to that person or your mate. That's why I'm not telling you because you don't understand. You know, and I don't want to be a burden to you because you're acting now the same way, the exact way I think that you would react if I told you something. So it's a very difficult situation that you're in, uh, but the consistency is, is really, really important. And just keep your close eye on them because uh, at some point, at some stage, they either will come to realisation themselves uh, or they, they will need to go and uh, get some support and they need to know that you're there for them. Eden Henninen, reporting for La Trobe Life. Hey guys and welcome back. Um, we are now joined by our senior producer Brett Sinclair. Brett, how are you? Good, thank you. It's good to uh, be super. here today. Um, you went along with, I believe you went along with Eden to the mental health event. Yes, correct, I did. We went a couple of weeks ago, so it was really insightful, just really interesting learning about mental health, men's mental health and the stigma around it. And it was really strong, some of the content that we saw there, some of the stories that were told. But at the same time, from what I saw there, they are doing a really good job in general society as a whole and reducing the stigma. Cool. Now, just checking in base, that was here at La Trobe Uni, no doubt, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so super. It was in the Odeon room. And so that's like just down there, not too far from the media hub. And yeah, it was a small venue, got about 50 people there, so decent turnout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so, Brett, with the whole men's mental health and that that sort of thing, um, you went along to this event and there were, there were people talking about it. What do you think the stigma is around men's mental health? The most? Stigma. Oh, I reckon it's more just around like a s typical Australian culture, like going back 20, 30 years ago, the old Aussie bloke culture of, you know, harden up or she'll be right, mate, or you're tough as nails, you know, kind of thing. And just around that, so if someone had a problem or like they went feeling real mentally and wouldn't speak up and so you, the depression will get worse if they're not treating it and they're just bottling out the feelings and they just feel like they're going to explode. And so obviously we don't want that happening. Of, of course, back then, that's the, more the culture. Like if you came out and said, oh, you know, I've got this problem, people would just go, oh, you're weak or you can't handle being a man or in terms of the old masculine stereotypes, yeah. in terms of being a strong, independent man. And yeah, especially definitely. in sport as well. So there were the AFL player Nick Del Santos, he was there on the day. Do you think that AFL players are more prone to depression and anxiety? I think they are, depending... I'm not saying not taking anything away from construction workers, school teachers and doctors, anything like that, but when you look at the AFL industry now, mm -hmm. it's like when they've got all these massive contracts, you know, like Lance Franklin's on like $1.1 million a year, Tom Boyd is on a million dollars a year, and not all of them are on that money, of course, but at the same time, you've got these massive expectations placed mm. on these young men, and I reckon, and you've got this 24-hour media scrutiny, of course, how the times are now, and it can be quite confronting for a player, you know, if you have a bad week and all of a sudden you've got people blasting you on Twitter and, you know, you don't feel secure, and if your contract's up at the end, at the end of the year and all of a sudden it's like... You know, anxiety keep creeps in if you don't have a career backup option and, you know, at a crucial stage of your life, definitely, in your yeah. mid-20s. Yeah, I'd have to agree. But I reckon there's a bit more extra pressure with, like, you know, the AFL and so forth with them, you know, being role models and so forth. Like, there's a lot of, like, fans and a lot of young kids and stuff that look up to football players because that's what they aspire to be. Um, I'm sure it's no different to, like, you know, people being astronauts back in the 1960s or something like that, you know? It's, like, a big... Th it's a big thing. And people, like, look at actors and they look at sports players and stuff like that and people who are in a, you know, highlighted professional industry and they think that they must be, you know, invincible or, like, you know, they're tough as nails, as you once said, spoonful of concrete, that sort of thing. And I think that, like, that contributes a lot to them seeming like they don't... They shouldn't have issues. Yeah, definitely. When you look at Lance Franklin, for example, when he came out two years ago and it's just like he's the biggest player in the game, he can do it all on the field. He's got, obviously, the million-dollar contract. He lives on Bondi, as Nick Del Santo said. He's got a supermodel wife. He's like, you look on the outside and it's like he's got everything anyone could ever want and then depression happens and it just goes to show it can happen to anyone. Depression doesn't discriminate, doesn't care who you are, what you have, what you don't have, who you know, what you don't know. It can just strike at any time. And I know Franklin being seen as a role model, especially for Indigenous kids growing up, and just like 
looking at that happened to him. It shows it can happen to him. It can happen to anyone, and it doesn't matter how big a hero, how big a hero or role model they are. You know, and I suppose for society to see that happen back then, it got a lot of people talking about depression and mental health in general, and just being aware of you know asking a mate, you know, Franklin can have it, anyone can have it. Just ma check on your mates, and obviously Franklin had the support of the football club. Football clubs fantastic environment for when times are tough. You know, you got all the people around you. You got psychology services, uh, counsellors, a whole lot to help you get through it. And it's really good. Franklin put his hand up and gave awareness, which gave the strength for other players and other people to put the hand up. And, you know, it's OK if you need help. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's the examples of uh, players such as, like, Travis Cloak and Tom Boyd, who are a little bit less heard of than uh, Lance Franklin. But they've they've been outspoken or something along those lines, yeah? Yeah, so with Tom Boyd, his situation is completely different. Being a young man, signed on a million-dollar multi-year contract for the Western Bulldogs. So he's signed on like $900,000 a year in his first year at the club when he's only been playing football for three years. And that's a massive expectation for someone of his age when he's not yet an established player. It's just finding his friend in the game, you know. He's yeah, at that's the time, huge. he only played like 40 games and all of a sudden they're expecting him to perform up to Lance Franklin levels when Franklin's a seasoned professional. And Travis Cloak, at the same time, he's been well scrutinised in the media over the years and in terms of his goal kicking and that and for him to have a fresh start at the Bulldogs after leaving Collingwood and then having put his hand up halfway through early this year just saying you know he's got depression and it just shows maybe all the scrutiny has gone to him and you know but it shouldn't be like that you know you shouldn't be having those feelings and feel that way but about the football we should be able to enjoy and it's good he's put his hand up and getting the help that he needed. Yeah, exactly. What uh, about, are there any tips that you have for people that do suffer with depression or how can we assist them in our community? Yeah, so on the day, there was some really good tips that was sold. Like, so Jake Edwards, he said things like, um, if you've got two weeks or if you see a friend, you know, if they're not, if you think they're struggling, just let them know you're there for them. Don't say like, have you got depression or mental health to say, are you okay? Let them know you're there for them. They may not open up right away, but just be ready. They might open up in like two, three weeks. And then, so that when they come to you, just be ready, you know, don't say, oh, I'm not ready. And then all of a sudden, when they're ready to open up to you, it's like, oh, you're here to help me. But just check on them every two weeks, you know, just go around, see them at the house or go out and do an activity, like shoot some hoops or go out for lunch or something. A good suggestion Jake said was if you drive around with them, just drive around with them an hour in the car, you know, just chat to them. They, they can't escape or anything like that, oh. but just be real <laughs> easy with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, the best, so best kind of therapy, car, <laughs> trip, car trip with some loud music. Put the child lock on and take child them lock. for a ride. <laughs> That's it, joy ride. <laughs> exactly. And um, we have a, like a mental health service here at La Trobe Uni that can uh, help people out, yeah? Yeah, definitely. We've yeah. got lots of services here at La Trobe, so if people need services, just send a con contact the counselling services. You can look it up online on the Trobe website on latrobe.edu.au and seek the services that you need. So they're very good here. So if anyone from La Trobe or students in general reach out, just reach out to local uni if you're studying here and they'll be more than happy to help. Free of charge, of course. So Yeah, it's I think nice. it's, um, yeah, it's in the Parabolas building and they're um, available for appointment on request. So, yeah, definitely give them a call, email them, get yeah, in definitely. touch with them. Get in touch with them if needed. Super. All right. Thank you very much, Brett, for joining us. Now, Tiff, we're moving to a news recap. Absolutely. Well, once again, we have the North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un. He's decided against an order to attack the island of Guam, which is excellent news. Um, this was reported on Tuesday by the Korean Central News Agency, and they'd previously released a statement detailing the attack. Kim will instead be watching the US actions for a little longer. Uh, in AFL, Western Bulldogs captain Robert Murphy and Hawthorne star Job Gibson have uh, announced that they're retiring at the end of this season. Um, Gibson joins fellow Hawthorne veteran Luke Hodge in retiring and wrapping it up. Uh, the Western Bulldogs and Hawthorne play each other Friday night in front of a bumper crowd. To witness potentially Murphy and Hodges' last game, with both sides all in contention to play finals. In the weather, there will be a top of 16 degrees and a low of 9 this afternoon. 
thank you guys for tuning in to the 10 Express. We broadcast every Wednesday at 10 a.m. from the brand new Media Hub. You can catch us live on upstart.net.au as well as our Facebook and Twitter pages at the 10 Express. And if you want to contact us directly, you can send news to our email address, the 10 Express at hotmail.com. That's great. I know, right? That's terrible. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Um, now we'll jump into our next segment, which is Millennial Media. One of our news reporters from the 10 Express, Geordie Little, has joined us today for our segment uh, where we will bring a youthful touch to the week's current events. Geordie, hey guys, how, you how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yourself? Oh, very, very well. Of course. All the time. So this week's topic, we're going to be discussing the plebiscite that's happening at the moment. Yeah, yeah, the, the postal plebiscite. What are your thoughts? My thoughts? Um, well, I think it's, it's a sort of, it's an effort by the government to swim against the tide a little bit, I think. Um, they can see where this is going. They can see that the same-sex marriage is, is inevitable in Australia. It's the, the will of the people. But, uh, you know, it's a delaying tactic. They're, uh, I think they're trying to delay it as much as possible. Yeah. Um, now the plebiscite, you know, it's 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 a big one, 122 mil. It is for a it non-compulsory is. vote. For an optional vote. What do you think about that? Um, it does seem like a lot of money, hey. Yeah. But um, seems like a lot of money we could be put elsewhere. Be putting elsewhere. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are there are plenty of places that that 120 odd mil could be better used. Um, like the uni cuts that are happening. Like as the well. uni cuts. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to be frank with you. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, so they're, like, they're partnering up with the, what is it, Bureau of Statistics? Yeah, yeah. Partnering the, up uh, with the, the electoral ABS. role? Yeah. Yeah? That's, um, that's actually part of the, you might have heard about the high court challenge that's being made. Um, it's uh, Andrew, oh, you know, I can't remember the independent MP's name, but it's an independent MP and marriage equality advocates are, are taking this to the high court to challenge it. And uh, apparently part of the challenge is going to be that the ABS is meant to collect stats, not uh, opinions. It's not an opinion polling uh, service. So they'll be challenging the legality of the of the postal <coughs> plebiscite based partly on that. Oh, okay. Mm. That's very interesting. So the after the plebiscite goes down and we put in our votes and stuff like that, the MPs are allowed to... They, they're given a vote or something yeah, it's, along it's, those lines? Yeah, it's non-binding. So at the end of all this, the uh, the MPs, there'll be a free vote in Parliament and the MPs have no uh, obligation to vote according to the result of the wow. plebiscite. Um, I mean, to an extent, they have a political obligation because the, their constituents aren't going to uh, think they very kindly of them. They don't want to make themselves them. look yeah. bad. But there's there's no real obligation, and there have been MPs and uh, and senators, I believe, that have refused to say that they would respect the outcome of the plebiscite. So, um, hmm. you know, we'll see where it goes. That's sad. It's really sad. You know, well, we're going sad. to have um, ballots will arriving from will be arriving from September twelve in your mailboxes. So definitely, everyone's campaigning. Double check if you actually are enrolled to vote because I think it's. Forty percent of age eighteen to twenty four year olds aren't actually enrolled to vote, which is illegal here in Australia. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a very high number. Hey, so uh, That's shocking. No ballot paper, just to find instead. Yeah. <laughs> well, you won't you won't be fined for not voting in the plebiscite because it is yeah, yeah. optional. But sooner but or later, they're yeah, going to catch up. Sooner or later, they'll they'll get you. Absolutely. Um, now, if the original plebiscite couldn't pass the Senate. Why is the government, you know, putting in this poster one? Like, well, what's what's the deal? What's the difference? Yeah, the, uh, what, what's well, going on? Well, the difference is that there's no legislation involved here. The government, because this is technically actually not a plebiscite, this is a, a postal vote, yeah. and that means the government doesn't actually need to pass any legislation to make it happen. So, um, mm. so that's why they're bypassing the Senate completely because the Senate uh, has has refused to pass the plebiscite twice now, mm. and they're saying, all right, well, we'll do this. Cool. So, like, same-sex marriage advocates, along with like their independent MP, the Andrew Wiki, is it Andrew Wiki? Andrew, yeah, Wilkie, I think. Yeah, Wilkie. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, they've launched our high court challenge, which you were talking about before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, what's the rundown with that? Because, like, you know, I haven't heard about it, so yeah, I'm not um, sure if our viewers have either. As I understand it, there are. Uh, it's it's not all public at the moment, but what we've got so far is that there are maybe two components to this. And one of them is that the ABS is, is this is not really the ABS's role. 
Uh, the other component might be that uh, Turnbull is sort of overstepping his executive powers here by, by using this postal vote as a plebiscite and that that might be unlawful. So the High Court will be ruling on that in early September, I think about a week before the plebiscite, and um, then the votes will be... I mean, the, uh, the ballots will be getting sent out afterwards if it is cool. ruled to be legitimate. Well, I think cool. it is expected that we'll have a result by the end of November 15th. OK. Yeah. Easy. Um, now on to slightly lighter news. Um, Domino's tried giving away their 10,001 free pizzas to promote the launch of a new premium range. What are your thoughts on Domino's pizza, Tiff? I'm a diehard Pizza Hut gal, I must admit. <laughs> but so like, I'm not... 10,001. 10,001 pizzas. Yeah, why the one? Um, Is that something to do with their Facebook likes I've... or... I have 10, no idea, but like 10,001, they gave away 10,001 okay. free pizzas. Okay. Um, f- but before they gave it away, of course, they had a broken link on their Facebook page, which very disgruntled uh, customers, you know, very disgruntled customers were not uh, happy with at all. Um, so it kind of backfired, yeah. Yeah, kind, kind, of, kind of backfired. I feel but like for all the people, for all the pizza lovers in Australia... 10,000 just isn't enough. It's just not going to cut it, to be honest with you. Yeah, but they gave away 10,001 free. <laughs> like, that's that's the big the, the big thing is free, you know? And even if they did have a broken link, they soon rectified it and, and people got their pizza that they're after. Oh, that's good. That's very good. You say, what are you... Geordie, man. So, Domino's Pizza. pizza. Domino's. Domino's Pizza. Um, are you a my... Domino's or a Pizza Hut man? Oh, jeez. Uh, I mean, Domino's... I feel Domino's the pizza is quite average, but the garlic bread is very good. They make a great oh. garlic bread at Domino's. Oh, yeah. so Super garlic bread. Right. Yeah, get cool, on there, get cool. 10,000 garlic bread out of this. <laughs> That'd be right. So would you be I'd down be cheaper for them you, as well. you down for like one of those 10,001 pizzas, you know, like if they um, do Yeah, I'd jump on it. If for they sure. do it again, <laughs> if they do it again, we've got to get we got to get on this quick. Well, yeah, absolutely. I guess we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see if they try and make it work again, hey. Well, I yeah, think exactly. the offer actually came for the free pizzas after Pizza Hut gave away 10,000 free margaritas. So there's, that's oh, the extra that's one. That's the one. That's the one. They that wanted to best, <laughs> that would be the best competition. Pizza Hut. Trying to get a leg up. Leg yeah. up on Pizza Hut, yeah. But it was a little bit of a flop. Oh, yeah. Well, like... Although I, mean, I wonder whether pizza's more than just a cheese pizza. Was it more than a margarita? Who knows? Because then they would have won me over. If it was the ham and pineapple, well, they the, would have won me over. It's, it said that, you know, premium range... So I'm I'm oh, thinking yeah. I'm thinking premium range is probably like something a bit higher tier than just yeah. margarita, but At least like, like three or four toppings. Yeah, you would exactly. So, you would think but so. like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure what is what's going on. But I believe that uh, our J Mac is doing something along the lines of pizza. Yeah. Yeah, the Journalism Society here at La Trobe, they're going to be having a pizza night tonight. So it sounds pretty good. Like Jordy, you missed out on your free pizza. I did. Maybe I'll get down to J Mac yeah. and just yeah. grab myself one. I Probably. think it is. It's five bucks for entry, which is fine. Cause... Just throw down some five bucks. What's your What's your good fleet? Absolutely. Yeah. Shaun of the Dead. I don't <laughs> think you can get any better. Uh, I haven't seen it. To be I'm honest, I'm an advocate. That's a great film. That's Nick a great Frost. film. <laughs> wow. Nick Frost is like Nick Frost, and you know they, they come in a duo. Um, but I can't remember. Simon uh, Pegg. Simon Nick Pegg. Frost I was blanking. Simon Thank Pegg. you very much. Nick Frost and Simon Pegg. Like, I don't think you get any better. Like, they're, as far as comedy goes, they've pretty much nailed it. Like, they've got Hot Fuzz, they've got Shaun of the Dead, and they've got Paul, which was like, they were, they were roars. I loved it. Absolutely enjoyed them. Edgar Wright, the director, he did something weird too recently, didn't he? He did, um, I think he directed Spider-Man, maybe? It was something oh. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was something along the lines of, like, just really outright. Yeah, that's a little, like, whatever outside he's Outside of what he's normally done. Yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. But, to be fair, like... I went in along and saw Spider Man. I did it was too. It was amazing. A, it was a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> it was really, 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 really good. Um, anyway, now well, we're moving be, into. It's set to be a good night. Um, I think it'll be 6.15 in the Agora Cinema. So definitely get down there. Yeah. Get and your pizza. Now moving into something along the lines of Spider Man Pop Goes the Culture. Absolutely. Uh, this week we'll be speaking with our assistant producer, Georgie Meadows, about a Netflix documentary on the Amanda Knox trial. But before we dive into analysis, check out this short doco trailer. Did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. Do you know anything you have not told police? No. Italians are calling this the trial of the decade. We weren't best friends, but I was so 
shocked by what happened to her. Their friends were telling us how Amanda had been behaving, performing cartwheels and kissing each other. This does not look like grief. I mean, who behaves like that? Of course she did it. She's mad. Perché la calunniate? Mi potete dare una risposta? Dici, ma chi è responsabile? È un mostro. That's everyone's nightmare. Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing, or I am you. So, guys, we now have our assistant producer, the lovely Georgie Meadows. How are you today? Good, guys. How are you going? Oh, yeah, super as bad. always. Having fun presenting. Oh, oh yeah. It's been yeah. a great show. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going well. It. Been watching from a little TV in there. It's walking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos. Thank Kudos. you. Thank you. Ah. But you're joining us today to talk about you watch the Amanda Knox documentary. Yeah, so for our Pop Co's The Culture segment, I watch the Amanda Knox doco. Um, and... I well, I watched it on your recommendation yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will admit I didn't go go look for, looking for it myself. I didn't I didn't know much about it. so it was two thousand and seven the Amanda Knox trial or the yeah. start of the incident. So I didn't know much about it. I was twelve or thirteen, so I wasn't really into current affairs. It was more um, I watched like still ABC Kids after yeah. school or something. <laughs> so I found it really interesting. I really found um, you know, it was informative. I really liked the cinematography, the way that they used kind of like the shaky cam live footage and then the cleaner like Interviews, cutbacks. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of the Amanda Knox story itself, you're well across that one. Yeah. Well, so the trial went ahead and... And what was, and there was for murder, yeah? Um, yes, I believe so. It was yeah. Amanda and her boyfriend who were accused of <laughs> killing Amanda's roommate while she was on exchange. Mm -hmm. So um, they were found guilty of the crime, but then it turned out later on, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't yeah, seen it yet. Yeah, this conversation's <laughs> going to be full of spoilers. Um, well, they were let off, they were appealed because the evidence had been cross-contaminated mm -hmm. and I guess she was painted in the media to be something more than what she actually was. Yeah, well, they, they depicted her as, like a vixen, a witch. In the documentary, it went, all, went on about um, like that her and her boyfriend were a part of a cult, that they'd killed people before, just all these conspiracy theories and these yeah. journalis journalists, pardon me, uh, like taking the bait. And there was also the issue of, um, Amer well, she was an American citizen being trialled in Italy. So then there was also an international rivalry between the two countries, between Italy and the US. Um, which I thought was interesting. And you, so you had Italian journalists having their say and American journalists, each, you know, bogged down in agenda and bias going at the same trial, which I thought was really, as media students, I thought was a really interesting yeah. documentary from that perspective as well, how it was covered and how that impacted uh, the trial and Amanda's reputation. I guess your reputation is... Especially when um, she was doing a stint in prison after she'd first been convicted. Yeah. And um, I think her prison, her diary was released and there was something like seven or so names of her past boyfriends were on there and they yeah, named her and little black them. book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I thought that was not surprising. I think when you, when you can find... I mean, when someone's kind of convicted of murder and you can find any grit, any dirt to make that story more appealing, more juicy, for sake of a better to word, the public, yeah. to the public, yeah. you're going to go with it. And one of the um, British journalists who was interviewed throughout the documentary, that was basically what he admitted to. He was writing what the public wanted to know. He was getting these oh, yeah. sources, not necessarily double-checking them, and going with it for the sake of a good story. He was making uh, front page for weeks on end, um, which I thought was interesting. Because I think it came to, it was their first appeal and there was just, there was this one scene and there was a massive riot and everyone were kind of, everyone was kind of protesting with their signs and yeah. just saying like, she's guilty. Yeah, yeah. It was full on. It was a really interesting documentary. You haven't seen it, Jared? Have you? No, I haven't seen it. No. I, I like, I haven't. I haven't gone out of my way to see anything, but like from what you guys are describing, it sounds like 
sounds pretty intense. It's good to watch and um, it does, as a viewer, it keeps you on your toes. I mean, the trailer that we showed before was Suspect Her. Um, that's what it's named when you search the Amanda Knox trailer on YouTube. Okay. And they actually have a series of trailers. So it's like uh, Trust Her and then the whole essence of that trailer is evoking sympathy from audiences. Then there's one that's Suspect Her and obviously you're meant to be um, sceptical. And there's another word that's um, – there's another one. It was trust, suspect, question or something like that. And I thought that was interesting. To, before the documentary even aired, you're playing on people's emotions. It's a real event. Yeah. People can read and research and make their – like, you know, kind of go into the documentary with their own opinion. But then that – I think that was a nice – just interesting a nice to way get, to market it. A nice yeah. way to market it, yeah. yeah. Like, okay, so but you might have, you might have, you, you probably alive, you probably remember it, you probably read up on it, but we're going to make you, 10 years later, we're going to make you question that again. Because was she guilty or not? Yeah. And it turns out the final decision was they appealed two times and mm. then they were let off for the crime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think... That's a big thing though, like getting let off for murder. Like even if it was a conviction of murder, like uh, only two appeals. And then they were, like, let yeah. off that. That's, that's yeah. huge. Over uh, over eight years. It, yeah, but still, yeah, like... I know. But if, if she was, I'm saying if because mm. no one really knows the true story mm. here, that's a long time to be caught up in that kind of... Yeah, thing, like, especially if you were, like, if you were innocent, like, eight yeah. years. Mm, ages. Yeah, exactly. That she's not going to get back. No, definitely not. And what I find interesting about this... Uh, documentary as well, it kind of complements the rising trend of true crime stories. Have you guys noticed that, uh, like with like Making a Murderer, uh, Orange is the New Black, which obviously is fiction but based on the true memoir of um, Piper Chapman, who was the real like inmate yeah. in prison. It's been, it's I don't know, I don't know. There's no, just no. more and more true crime, true yeah, crime it's, stories coming it's like, out. Um, you know, like making a murder on yeah. Have Netflix. You seen it? That, yeah, that's a big, that's a big one. I've seen. Well, that, that has almost like a cult sort of following. Thing. Yeah, Well, exactly. it did when it was brand new, at least. And there was another one that aired on Channel Nine like ages ago. Mm. Like, a, like a, it was like a murder mystery one or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, like like a who how, how to make a thing. murder sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, how to get a, oh how to get away with murder. That's what the show was called. And it oh, was yeah. it was all about like a uh, university professor lecturing, uh, you know, like a law and uh, like yeah. Criminal. That's a, that's a Shonda Rhimes TV show. Yeah, exactly. So who does Grey's oh, Anatomy? Grace, so yeah. it's less so. True factual. crime, less so factual, yeah. less so documentary, but still, I, it's kind still, of, still sticking to that. Yeah, like there's that the theme. essence of it. Yeah, exactly. And I was doing, um, actually doing some research about it. Funnily enough, preparing myself, and um, I read a psychologist report about why this trend is increasing, especially on Netflix. Like you'll notice that a lot of the true crime documents yeah, exactly. and, um, are specific to Netflix, and Netflix really has nothing to do with it. It's just a great platform that is getting a bigger and bigger following. But the true crime comes down to, the psychologist was saying, comes down to, um, like, you know, humans' uh, need for an adrenaline rush and need for, like, intrigue and insight. So by keep these shows keeping you on the edge of your seat, getting that adrenaline, adrenaline rush going, but in a safe and controlled environment, um, that's, um, like, that's essentially why... These, these shows have such a large following because you get to follow it, you get to, you know, get it all excited might be the wrong word, but at least invested, emotionally invested without the risk of actually endangering yourself because there's yeah. a screen and a script between you and what you're watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for someone who's never, I've never been involved in legal trouble, so I don't know what happens in the court. So that's, or in prison yeah. either. So it is, it's really interesting to mm. delve into those types of fantasies, if you will. Yeah, yeah. The closest I got to a court was a, Parking fine and car park, car park <laughs> six, which I've disputed. I took that. Uh, I took that back because I had my permit. So I think I'm just going to stick to roller coasters for my adrenaline rush, though. You yeah, know? fair not, enough. Not not a big one on the true crime docos, and I think like that's that's your area of expertise. So I didn't so sell I you like, the Amanda Knox no, doco well enough. Uh, You're going to stick to Lone Park. Fair no. enough. Yeah, that's fair. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Jordy. Thanks, guys. That's okay. Um, this is the Ten Express. The time is now 10.44. Very precise, I know. Um, we broadcast every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, from the Latrobe Media Hub. It's very brand new and we're very lucky to be here. Absolutely. If you want to hit us up on Twitter or Facebook, it's at the Ten Express or the 10 Express. 
Um, and if you want to send us anything, you can send news to the 10 express at hotmail.com. Um, now we've got an exciting segment, probably my favorite for the show. Uh, it's called, do you even sport? Um, and the wonderful Jacob Lee Joy Berry, um, was the one who crafted this, um, and it's where members of our team go and play the most ridiculous sports we can absolutely find. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, this week we've got wife carrying, um, and we'll let you have a look at that now. Three, two, one, go! Hello, everybody. Here we go. It's the beginning of the North American Wife Carrying Championship 2016. Oh, easy moving around. Team nine falling behind. Welcome back, everyone. We are now joined by Jacob Joyberry. Now, Jacob, do you even sport? Tiff, I am the only one who sports. I am the epitome of sport, excellence, and perfection, unlike Jared over there. So, of course, I sport. <laughs> Big words for a small man. Yeah. Um, so, we decided to put a 10 Express spin on wife carrying, didn't we, Jacob? Yeah, we did. It was a lot of fun. Um, Jake and I went head to head in the first edition of Do You Even Sport? <laughs> Keep going. All right. So we've had a bit of a hiccup with Do You Even Sport Technical at the moment. Difficulty. So we'll... Uh, Not to spoil anything, but wife carrying. Wife carrying. Should I tell rules you about Rules for it? wife carrying. The rules for wife carrying. Basically, you've got a 253.5 meter course, which has two dry obstacles and one water obstacle, like a small pool, where you have to carry a female contestant of at least Three, 48 kilos two. along the track. The fastest time wins. If the, uh, the partner you've got is less than 48 kilos, they will be stacked up with weight until they reach the minimal benchmark. Ooh. And, yeah, which could look pretty funny, actually. It's like a lot of stuff just hanging <laughs> off them. And, um, yeah, um, pretty much as fast as time wins. You have to have fun. It's in the rule book. There is no sour faces at the end of this. It's only to have fun. The winner gets a lovely prize of bragging rights and happiness and a good workout and a light shower, really, from the water obstacle. And it's all around just a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, but of course, you know, with with the limited things that we had here at La Trobe <laughs> University, there was no uh, water obstacles because no one was volunteering to swim in the moat. Yeah. And no the land obstacles, we gave a bit of a miss because, you know, we're not the fittest of wife carries. Exactly. I'm, I'm a pretty <laughs> slender guy. I don't think I can carry my lady over lots of <laughs> rocks and fences and stuff. She might get dropped and hurt me. Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Excellent. What about, talk us through the technique for wife carrying. The technique for wife carrying is pretty much you want to... um. Well, Jared did it in the thing. He did the um, he did the professional wife carrying technique, and that was when you um, you get down nice and low, and then you, um, you be- bob your head down, and the f- the woman goes over your back, and their legs go around here, so it's like a <laughs> harness, and they're just hanging off your back like a cape, and then you're jogging around holding them, and they're trying not to Die. headbutt your pe- the your collar your not collarbone tailbone collarbone's up here. So, um, yeah. I'd say they're trying not to die because you know, that from, too. From, what, from what I saw, though, it was it was <laughs> from what I heard. Was I was intensive. spectating on the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What did you think watching it, by the way, as a spectator? It was bizarre, weird, yeah. but it was really fun to watch, to be honest. That's good. Would what you try it? Uh, as the wife or as the carrier? Either or. I don't know. Hmm. I feel like there are a lot of injuries that could be involved in wife carrying, especially with the obstacles. Mm, if, if you get dropped, you might definitely, because you're face first. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Well, I wonder if there have been any incidents. I would imagine so, especially in the early years of wife carrying when there was not many when it wasn't regulations and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like, just go over this fence. You'll be fine. What about the legalities? Does your wife have to be legally your wife no actually it's just um female contestant i'm pretty sure back in the day there would have been a specific wife thing that like wife yeah. ruling place because why else would it be called wife carrying yeah. yeah exactly but um now it's just female contestant of at least 48 kilos you being know, carried by a male contestant I'd, I'd definitely like to try the other way but i just need to find a strong enough man to you know <laughs> yeah you carry me around well i could give it a shot I'm oh pretty, well i do play pokemon go a lot like i'm pretty oh pretty yeah athletic pretty, my, pretty nimble yeah, pretty my athletic. Calves are pretty strong <laughs> i've got to go catch those pikachus when i can Oh, of course. What about those Zapdos? Is it? I haven't got one yet. Oh, got well, one yet. we don't talk you about know, that. You just got to get on another level. We're talking about the peak of athleticism and haven't even tried that. Oh, Jesus. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I well, stopped playing Pokemon Go when I think all my progress got wiped because I was the OG. I signed up with no. like a username, but then they linked it to Google accounts and everything gone. Oh, that's so unfortunate. Ugh, no. Months of progress. I was about four or five months behind, and then I got back into it about two months ago, and then my girlfriend's into it as well the last month, and we've just been walking around just random walks around the neighborhood yeah, at like good. Good any exercise. time of the day just to try and find something to do, really. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Maybe a future occurring segment on Do You Even Sport? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Extreme Pokemon Go. Yeah, that could be some stuff. Extreme Pokemon Go. Well, I know... Um, Might have to incorporate a bit of parkour into that. We could do parkour, oh. parkour go, Parkamon Go. That could be. Okay. That That's a bit of a mouthful. Really good. Yeah, we should try that. You should do it. Either extreme killer, sport. Though. Extreme sport. Yeah. Right there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, actually, with, um, with Fisher segments, since we're talking about it, next week we have egg throwing. Yes. Ooh. Which um, exactly. I'm really excited about. I'm going to get a plastic bib for the weekend when it's going to be all happening. Because <laughs> um, in that one, basically, you just got to throw the egg as far as you can and catch it. Without obviously, if the egg breaks, you lose. So you, I think you get a few tries. I haven't fully got the um, the rules down yet, as I'm still researching the topic because it is a very delicate subject. Egg throwing. It's a pun on eggs. You guys didn't laugh. I'm upset. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So it'll be. I think it's best of three. If um, the longest catch wins, and I guess we're just gonna have a thrower, and we'll catch it. So yeah, how exactly. do you think you're gonna go with that one? Um, look. Might be a bit more difficult to you because uh, delicacy is not my speciality. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm I like to be rough Are they and hands-on. Hard eggs or not? No, they're 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 raw, raw eggs. eggs. Raw wow. eggs as straight out of the chicken. Wow. Not quite as warm. Though, straight out of the chicken. Exactly, straight out of it. Regulation <laughs> size, regulation heat. That's ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Um, the bunch of chicken now. Yeah, but like, you know, maybe with my uh, big bear paws, you mm. know, maybe with my big bear paws, I might have something. That um, could be good. But we have another topic today. Yeah. Between you and I, we another do. showdown. Another showdown that we've got to hit up, which is pineapple on pizza. I am one hundred and ten percent not in agreement. I actually tried a bit of Hawaiian pizza that my housemate was cooking last night, and it was terrible. Oh. Is it just because they're a bad cook? Or no, it's, taste it's, it's just because the, you know pineapple doesn't belong on pizza. Why would you do that to yourself? Because it's a lovely fruit. It's it's amazing. Why is it? It should be structured. This we should. All right, guys. Let's make this official. Official. I'm going to give you one minute each. Yep. In the great debate. So today is the question of meat and sweet pig and pine. We'll start off with Jacob. Genius or abomination? Is the pineapple pizza your friend or foe? Genius and friend. Unlike Jared, who is abomination and foe, the pineapple pizza just brings everything you need. You got a kids' party. Pineapple pizza. No one does not like pineapple. Pineapple is sweet. It's juicy. It makes a pop of color on it. You can't have a pizza when you're six and it be like a Supreme. Who eats olives when you're six? No one does that. Like, you could go to the Aussie, which is a bunch of meat and eggs and stuff, but where's the little, there was the fun little flavor. It doesn't, it doesn't look really appetizing to a six-year-old, right? Exactly. It's just one of those staples that you have throughout your life. The Hawaiian pizza, it's just, it's just amazing. Like, how can you not have it? Come on. You can't be disrespecting the pineapple pizza on one of the anniversaries of, like, not the anniversary, like the same year that the creator of the Pineapple Pizza passed away. He was a legend. How can you do that to him? It's just unfair. Like, 
Honestly, if you don't like pineapple pizza, you should just go and find a good one from anywhere in the world because they're no bad ones and eat it and enjoy it. And if that doesn't work, you should just get a tongue replacement because there's something wrong inside your tongue. All right, time's up. Look, I'm in completely complete disagreements. All, all that, all that I can say is that kids' parties. Gordon Ramsay, about it. you know, Gordon Ramsay said, in his own words, he slammed the pineapple pizza. It's called it an abomination because that's what it is. That's what it is. You but said can you Aussie. Gordon Ramsay. No, no, no. You said. That Aussie is an appealing thing, but it's just got meat and egg, and it's just full of gains. That's how you get these. Jacob. Six-year-olds aren't bodybuilders. Gains, <laughs> gains, Jacob. <laughs> oh, fine. Anyway, we're going to throw back to wife carrying, so we can yeah. have a look at that. I'm excited. Um, let's have a look at it. technical difficulties at the moment, but I can confirm that Jared was the winner of the wife carrying segment. Of course. Because what do you have to say about your victory? Well, I just have to say, you know, Joy Berry may have won the great debate. But we all know what actually counts. And that's when I destroyed him after he cheated <laughs> in wife carrying, of Look. course. <laughs> I got spooked by the dog. There was a dog barking. I was scared. I didn't want to run towards the dog. So I had to turn early. It's not my fault that you're a big lumberjack with no fear in your eyes. Like you're absolutely stone cold killer. I am a little, little frightened man. I have no, to turn from I, the vicious dog. I, I didn't hear any dog. Tiff, did you hear any dog? I don't think so. Then maybe it was a glaring sun rays. I wasn't wearing no, sunscreen. I don't want to be no, out there for too long. No. Like, it just I, had to happen. I am 110% in doubt that you just turned early because you wanted to win. And I'm what happened? You just got outclassed because I'm the better athlete. You just, you're a cheerleader. Yeah. I play Pokemon Go for my exercise. Come on, I walk. <laughs> Pokemon walk. <laughs> Not Pokemon cheerlead hold people and run around. Yeah, well, like, look. Next so time choose a sport that uh, the... you know, next time choose a sport that you're not going to get beaten at. We are. We're playing egg throwing, <laughs> and I have these <laughs> lovely hands. Look at these fast hands. Yeah, Can't but look at, these, look at these. Bear look at these Look at these bear fours. They they're going to do some things. What do bears do? Eat ah. stuff and push over trees. And catch eggs, apparently. <laughs> no, they don't. They're going <laughs> to break the eggs. <laughs> I don't think the eggs are a part of a bear's diet, unfortunately. Uh, well, bears have to get gained somehow. Eggs are that's, a form that's of protein. That's for the salmon. <laughs> they go salmon fishing. <laughs> 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 Well, yeah, see, bears, they can, they can catch salmon. They must be pretty nimble pretty quick. They do this. If you see a bear catch a salmon, they just do this and then they go eat it. Uh, that's my egg climb. throwing. Yeah, egg throwing, just catch. <laughs> if you do that and catch an egg from like 50 meters, I'll be very impressed. Ah, uh, yeah, I just have to forfeit. Well, going into next week. All right. Now, finally, finally, we can actually see what happened and how Joy Berry got crushed. We just don't know. Jared's catching up. He's a fast man. He's fast like Sonic. Oh, he's overtaken Jacob. But what this? Jacob has cheated again. He's gone back early. He's going for the win. He's running. He's running. He's looking panicking. He's looking back. Jared's coming fast. And oh my god, it's Jared by a hair. That was so close, ladies and gentlemen. I can't believe what I just saw. Jacob is. And what have you witnessed, Jacob? Once again, crushing defeat. <laughs> I have witnessed someone who probably shouldn't be carrying someone lose a race. Exactly. Jared, <laughs> hashtag one, a Jacob, a Joyberry, a zero. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us for thank our you. very first show. Uh, we'd like to thank, well, actually, we'll be broadcasting live next Wednesday at 10 a.m. And we'd like to thank all of the crew that made it possible, as well as our producer, Brett Sinclair, and assistant producer, Georgie Meadows, who we could hear screaming for her dear life in the wife-carrying segment. <laughs> uh, that was also 
a really good instalment of Do Even Sport and a riveting great debate. We will be bringing those back next week. Thank you so much for joining us once again. I'm Tiff Cole. I'm Jared Friday. And this was the lovely Jacob. Be there or be square. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Have a great day.